Okay, so uh, so in this session, we're focused on uh, empirical methods and what we can do um, as editors to smooth getting papers through the, the through the methods check and uh, increasing the probability that all of the work that goes into a paper turns into a, a publication. So it's good to start from the basics. You know, what is Journal of Operations Management? So we are focused on the management of operations. We publish scholarly research. Uh, we want to have academic research, uh, academic relevance. But then the other thing is that we want every article to provide insight that helps people in the field making decisions to have a clearer sense of, of what is available to them. Uh, the journal is empirically focused. Uh, with When we think about a conceptual paper, a conceptual paper usually starts from something that is observed out in the world of practice. Uh, so that we find that over the years, some of our, our most powerful papers have been conceptual. Um, we also are open to literature reviews, although the bar is quite high. Uh, the journal was focused, was founded uh, exactly 40 years ago this month. Uh, so we would rather be all together celebrating this, uh, but we're not. We're here uh, in Zoom, but that's better than nothing. But 40 years uh, is an exciting date for us. Uh, and we are really focused on different methods, a wide variety of methods and a, a wide variety of theories. So let's dig down a bit deeper. So if we think about science, uh, then loosely speaking, we observe some regularities and we learn something. We make propositions about you know, the way the world might be uh, and we start understanding things about context, et cetera. Uh, and so when we observe something, then the question is, what can we learn? Well. We have a habit, and one of the things that Tyson and I really want to do um, is to break this habit of uh, going immediately to generalization. This is truth. And in something as messy as management, especially as messy as the management of operations, uh, generalization is often too big a step. So we spend a lot of time encouraging authors to figure out, hmm, so this is an interesting regularity that we're observing. What do we have the right to say from this? Sometimes the thing that we have the right to say is that, hmm, this gives us pretty credible evidence that a research question needs to be addressed. Uh, and then uh, another thing that can happen um, is that we had something that we thought was true. It just made such total sense to us, to everybody. And then when we actually go and observe what happens out in the field, uh, we find that that accepted theory uh, doesn't stand up to the test of implementation. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, and then uh, another thing is that we have conventional wisdom. Uh, let me give a, a quite silly example. Conventional wisdom says, if you treat people nicely, uh, then uh, it will lead to better outcomes. And, and you know who could disagree with that? But what if we're in a situation where somebody has to decide uh, between treating someone nicely uh, and not, what if treating someone nicely then puts us in a situation that will clearly lead to worse outcomes? Uh, there's not an obvious answer there. Well, of course, we want to treat people nicely, so it's maybe not such a great example. Uh, but uh, if we as researchers can give decision makers insight into the trade-off that um, is going to eventually emerge from application of conventional wisdom, then we are achieving you know, the goals that I've just been talking about. Uh, one thing is uh, to differentiate between proof and warrant. Uh, and Tyson and I are 
increasingly emphasizing that when we go and we do these studies, it's not about proving something about absolute truth, but it's more warrant, uh, providing evidence that uh, that a that a that a belief may well be true. Uh, and so we have um, a forum piece on warrant and what it means to go after warrant uh, that should be showing up in, in a few months. So that what we are doing is we are presenting arguments. And then we present those arguments to the decision maker saying, based on this, you might well end up with better outcomes, assuming that this theory is true as opposed to assuming the opposite. Uh, in order to do that, that is usually gonna come down to the quality of our methods. Uh, so let's take a look at how this lines up at JOM in terms of departments. Uh, so the um, top department here is Empirical Research Methods and Operations Management. And um, I'm delighted to announce that Guanji Cheng is going to be joining Miko Renke as a co-department editor as of the 1st of September. So, so welcome to Guanji. Uh, and then we have the usual departments, healthcare, innovation and project management, interorganizational relationships, intervention-based research, operations interfaces, operational systems, public policy, strategy and organization, sustainable operations, and technology management. Uh, and there's a lot, we, so we have a matrix organization between the empirical research methods department and then the other departments. Uh, now, uh, let me ask uh, whether Tyson has, uh, has gotten in yet. Um, yes, I've gotten here. Uh, great, Just okay. So, let me stop sharing my screen and let me pass. That's perfect timing. Oh, well, you can, why don't you just keep sharing since you're up? Oh, all right, I'm on it. Okay. And uh, looks like we're on slide five. So welcome we everyone. Sorry, I'm late. I had uh, technical problems, but we should be good. Uh, looks like we are at our editorial process here, which at first glance seems a little convoluted and overwhelming, but once you, get familiar with it. It's pretty usual with a couple of exceptions. So you see that manuscripts come in to Suzanne or myself as editors in chief, and we can either make a decision or assign it to a department editor. But on occasion, we send manuscripts for what we call a pre-review methods check. That's the check methods box you see there, which sends it to our empirical methods department which takes a look just primarily at the methods only. So it's not really evaluating contribution. It's not really evaluating uh, other aspects of it, but the questions are squarely about the methods. And what we had been doing was going through a couple rounds of review at some times, trying to get the methods just right, and then it would go into regular review. However, sometimes it would then be rejected for a lack of contribution. So we've decided more recently not to let that happen so much, to try to limit the methods check to one round in most cases and take those comments forward into the regular review process where necessary. So after that, it proceeds into a fairly typical review process, although JOM uses an AE and a department editor, as well as reviewers. I won't go through all of this process right now. That's not the point. This is explained fully in an editorial that Suzanne and I wrote in 2018. Uh, you can find for open access on the journal's website. But for now, we wanna highlight this pre-review methods check as this will be the topic of the rest of our session today. We can go to the next slide. Just some data from 2019. So this is last year, our full first full year with Wiley as the publisher and using the current online submission system, Scholar One. Last year, we published 38 articles, although of course, most of these were once submitted in prior years. 
And we had 537 new submissions. You see that we desk reject just over half of those, sometimes with input from a department editor. We sent 11% of those to this pre-review methods check that we're talking about. So about one in nine ends up going at times. We've dropped that off a little bit this year, but that's probably the right number roughly. We've, uh, as you can see, still got some manuscripts under consideration from last year. We've been using a decision called reject and resubmit quite a bit. This is where there's just a lot of uncertainty and risk in the revision, and we're not sure authors can do it in the sh short time frame that we normally look for with revisions. And we still want to give authors the benefit of the doubt, give them a shot at maybe coming back if they're able to answer the criticisms, which are substantial, but perhaps the authors can address them. So it's a possible way to come back, even though uh, the current manuscript wasn't viable. You see, we reject about 22% after review. And so far from last year, we've only accepted about 2%. However, our acceptance rate is typically about 6%. So out of those 30 manuscripts still under consideration, we probably would end up accepting a majority of those. As far as how busy various departments at JOM are, uh, you see our methods department getting those 58 pre-review methods check papers is uh, quite a lot for one department editor, which is why we've recently added a second one. And you can see among our other departments that are topical, like inter-organizational relationships, typically supply chain management type papers, uh, that was the busiest department, although we have three department editors there dividing up those manuscripts. Strategy and organization was next, and then operational systems, kind of the classical OM themes, and then sustainable operations, which was pretty busy for a single department editor as well, doing managing full review processes for that many manuscripts. Uh, however, we've added a second department editor this year in that department. Next slide. We want to highlight a few of our special issues that are coming up soon with their deadlines. You see our mobility, climate change, and economic inequality special issue announced last year has a deadline coming up at the end of the month. The managing marketing operations interface and omnichannel retail just a day later, coming up the 1st of September, as well as the technology management in the global context. So three special issues uh, with deadlines coming up in the next several weeks. And then a fourth one, global operations and supply chain management in the context of dynamic international relationships. This one's coming up in less than two months. So several special issues that uh, of course, most submissions come in near the deadlines. Uh, we're excited about these. And then on our next slide, we've announced four more special issues coming up for next year. The first of these has a deadline early next year at the end of January. This is the COVID-19 effects on global supply chains. Emphasis on the three R's, responsiveness, resilience, and restoration. So we're excited about this special issue and all the opportunities and data that this year is providing. Uh, for better or for worse, we're going to try to learn from this situation and do better for any future events that are similar. And then we've got three more special issues with deadlines later next year. All of these and their full calls for papers are available on JOM's website for further information. Next slide. Okay, so um, we always like to take the chance uh, to review guidelines that improve the probability that an author's paper will have a positive outcome. Uh, so the idea is that the journal is about community. It's about peers, helping peers develop their work. It isn't that 
the reviewer is an oracle who is going to come with some lightning bolt who says, you know, this is what needs to happen for your paper to be worthy. It is uh, that we want to agree together on what warrants publication. Uh, and uh, we also think about authors should be reviewing. Um, if you are submitting a lot of papers, then you should be also planning to review a lot of papers. And as papers, as people review papers, they tend to become better as authors uh, and they tend to become better writers. Uh, and then uh, making sure that the research is empirical. Um, you know, we, it's so sad to have an interesting paper uh, be desk, desk rejected because it, it is simply not empirical. Uh, when you submit a manuscript, Tyson and I start by reading the cover letter. And it really sets the stage for how we're going to look at your paper. It's a chance to tell us uh, things um, that will help us understand the right place to send the paper to. Uh, also, if you have a data set that's been used for something else, you know, tell us about it because then we can also help, help you through that. Uh, you know, if the paper has been rejected from another journal, uh, you know, tell us about that. You know, we, we would like for your paper to do well. So this is a great chance to help us. Uh, we publish a lot of editorials um, and then previous EICs have published very helpful editorials. We publish methods papers uh, and we are making these uh, resources available so that you know, we can tell you solutions that we've come up to for standard problems that people run into. And that's very much the spirit of, of what, we're, uh, what we're doing today. Um, so a uh, couple of the editorials. So Tyson and I wrote an article, editorial, edit, editorial in 2018, uh, laying out the process at the journal um, and uh, just helping people understand what will happen to their paper because the process that we have put in place that we think is going to end up with the best papers uh, is not the world's simplest process. Uh, so sometimes it's helpful to have some process documents. Uh, and then Tyson uh, wrote an article. So Tyson, uh, Tyson's own research um, didn't originally start as being classic operations management. Uh, depending on how we define operations management. And so he has transformed uh, that evolution um, into a very nice editorial on you know, operations writ large. Uh, and if you're trying to figure out, so if your paper doesn't address the management of operations, then even if we love the paper, it is not gonna go forward at the journal. So that I highly recommend Tyson's uh, editorial uh, to kind of see how what you're doing might be counted as managing an operation because most of the stuff that we do can be framed as, as an operation if we really want to go that direction. Strong statement, but you know, somebody proved me wrong. Uh, there are some departmental editorials, one on intervention-based research that was our event together with Tyson and me. Uh, uh, Anant Mishra and Tyson um, have um, an editorial coming up for innovation and project management. Uh, and then uh, uh, Gopesh Anand and John Gray uh, back in 2017 uh, had an editorial on strategy and organization. Tyson, and even if these uh, departments don't all have their own editorials full article editorials, uh, JOM's website contains mission and scope statements and information about each department. So you can certainly always go there. And other departments are at various stages of uh, developing further editorials. So these kind of come about as we see a need for them. And certainly as we get more questions and comments about what fits and so forth in certain departments, this prompts responses that may then develop towards editorials. This uh, slide here highlights some key methods papers uh, from JOM 
and about operations management. Now, this morning, we're going to be introduced to a lot of further sources and information on methods. It's very valuable. But at least we've captured here a few of the more recent JOM papers about some of these various areas. Uh, we can highlight over on the right, for example, uh, case study methods have been long used in JOM, and yet they're challenging to do well. And so we've had a number of papers come out to provide guidance on that. Uh, we'll be talking today about surveys and endogeneity and some of these issues. Uh, as far as experiments go, we have a 2018 paper and we're working with some authors to develop a kind of counterpoint response to that paper with some further ideas about how we do experiments in operations management. And so we are constantly evolving, developing, improving the methods we use, which is why it's very important to stay up to date with what is currently considered valid, appropriate methodologies. It's not always appropriate or satisfactory to cite papers, even in JOM, from 10 or 20 years ago that use particular methods and use that as your only rationale or justification for a method or a, a validity check or something like that. So we'll be getting more into that as we go today. Okay, uh, so with that, um, Miko will pass it over to you. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen. And, uh, Thanks for the introduction. And uh, now we're going to move on to the uh, next part of the workshop. And I'm going to talk about uh, the method review process. I'm Mikko Ranko, the department editor, or, or one of the department editors now of uh, Empirical Research Methods Department. And I'm from the University of Vivascula, where I'm shooting this uh, stream now. And um, uh, Suzanne stole two of my slides, or I stole two of her slides. So I'm just going to skip through the first two slides. And uh, we're going to talk about the methods check and, and what is the methods check about and, and why do we do methods check. And uh, the department basically does two kinds of things. First, we uh, review all the papers that are about methods. and uh, But that's a smaller part. There are a more important part why the department exists is that the journal gets some uh, particular quantitative studies that are difficult to evaluate, or some studies that are problems, and it's not sure if those problems can be solved. So problems in, in analysis or research design, and it makes sense to send out those uh, to a method specialist for review. And uh, Journal of Operations Management is not the only journal who does this kind of thing. So for example, Journal of Management uh, recently published an editorial that states that they are gonna uh, implement a similar procedure. So they will have a department where there are a couple of editors and then a collection of method specialists. And uh, Journal of Management does it a bit differently. So they will uh, first do a couple of rounds of normal review. And when it looks like that the paper could be accepted, then it goes to the methods check. And these kind of systems have been implemented by other journals recently as well. For example, Leadership Quarterly has done this for maybe two years now. Science has been doing it for, uh, I don't know how long, maybe 10 or 15 years. And uh, I think Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice has a similar procedure. Also, Strategic Management Journal has been doing something about methods recently. So, so this kind of um, introduction of uh, a method specialist to the review process is not a unique idea. So uh, what does the methods check actually do? So what do we do in practice? We uh, only evaluate if the study is done well. So when a paper is sent to be methods checked, then uh, what is being looked at is, do the data support the claim? We are not looking at whether the claim is important or interesting, but simply, is it done right? And um, the manuscripts that come to the journal, they tend to have a, a very similar set of problems. 
there are problems in dealing with endogeneity. There are problems with dealing in dealing with uh, method variants. There are certain problematic designs that we get all the time. And uh, just to make the process more efficient, we have uh, built up a template that you can download from the meeting website on, under this session that basically gives explanations or descriptions of those problems. And then when we get a paper that uh, has a problem, we just take the description from the template and uh, add some other observations, and then it goes back to the, to the author. So this is fairly efficient. And uh, typically, there is just one method review because uh, method reviews is, is more. It's not like it's uh, it's not as much evaluating the manuscript as it's about checking. So we're basically checking if things have been done correctly, and uh, these are typically not matters of opinion, but they are clearly right and wrong ways of doing things. So typically, there is just one review. Reviewer. And I tend to use student reviewers because I know that if a student comes right for, out from the method course, they will have the latest understanding of methodological research. And I might give a paper to one of my students and tell them to uh, evaluate the paper against uh, a specific lecture that I gave three months ago or against specific uh, Pay, uh, articles in, for example, organizational research methods. And this is good practice for the student as well. And uh, we are planning to expand the review pool, but the volume of papers that come to the department has been so high that I haven't been able to actually uh, expand the review pool yet. And it's very good to have a second department editor so we can actually start developing the resources of the department so that it doesn't rely so much on just uh, me being able to review uh, 50 to uh, 60 papers per year. And uh, then we have done a couple of post acceptance, acceptance checks. And uh, this was uh, the post acceptance check was implemented uh, first time, I think a year ago, when uh, a paper uh, from JOM was highlighted in my citation alerts. And I checked the paper, it was uh, online first, and uh, it made claims that didn't make much sense. And then we uh, quickly pulled the paper for a day or two, fix the paper and put it back up. So uh, sometimes we, we check papers after they have been conditionally accepted, just to make sure that there are no nonsensical statistics or nonsensical claims or clearly incorrect results that slip through because that does happen. What kind of uh, feedback can authors expect to get from the department? So here is an example of, um, a real letter from the department, the first eight points. And uh, this is uh, after the first round of method review. So some papers, as Tyson said, have gone through three rounds of method review before they go to the, uh, the actual department. And typically the methods tend to improve during those processes. So uh, I tend to uh, give uh, lots of citations like what to read about this, these things. And also the template contains lists of recommended readings on endogeneity, on method variants, on, on regression diagnostics and so on. So uh, in the department, um, as I said, we get basically three kinds of, of submissions. We get method submissions, a bit more than 10 per year. So this is not the methodological journal, but we do publish methodological papers as Tyson told. And these methodological papers are typically sent out to our uh, external reviewers. So if you uh, send a paper about survey data analysis to JOM, it might go to uh, one of the editor board members, and then we'll try to get someone, for example, for organizational research methods, editor board to be the second reviewer. Or we might just send it to method expert experts and uh, not anyone on the editor board, if it's about the method that we don't really have much competence in. Then the second class of papers are, are challenging on, on unconventional methods. And, and these are methods that have not been used in the journal in the past. For example, various machine learning papers, they come to the department or could come to the department. Uh, complex panel data econometrics, like dynamic panel analysis, or line of bond, that kind of stuff, that gets to, sent to the department. Basin analysis gets sent to the department and, and so on. So these are, th are papers for which it's difficult to find a reviewer because there is not that much 
people, that many people with solid understandings of these techniques. And then the third class of papers is, is programmatic designs and analysis. So quite often I get an email from Tyson or from Suzanne that this is an interesting uh, idea that the authors are proposing, but it's a cross-sectional survey and it doesn't seem that they have taken uh, method variance or causality very seriously. Can you check if there is something that, that can be done to, to make this a public case? So, so this kind of papers, and uh, this is the majority. So most of the papers that come to the method check are actually rather simple, and they might have design problems, they might be uh, missing some analysis, and the idea is to guide the authors to uh, make the paper publishable if possible. And if not possible, then simply explain why the current design that the authors have will not produce a JOM paper. So this has been run for two years now, and we have processed, um, I don't know, a bit more than 100 papers, maybe closer to 131, something like that. And um, Zusan has been asking me to, uh, to write the editorials. So whenever I, I find a problem in a published manuscript, and I talk about that problem to Susan, she tells that uh, you should write an editorial about that. And I, I thought about it, but I would be writing an editorial for almost every issue of JOM. And I don't think that's a good use of my time, and I don't think that's good uh, use of the journal web pages. So I decided that we need to put uh, together a paper that explains the common methodological problems in OM research as seen through the papers that the department receives. And uh, to do that, I asked two uh, persons who I've trained during their doctoral studies and who are really good at methods, at least I think they're really good, uh, to help me and, uh, and uh, write a paper about what are the problems that we find. So basically what I did with uh, Gabriela Latikan and Henni Tenhunen is to go through uh, a bunch of editor letters that I've written during the review process and some reviewer statements and check why are papers rejected and uh, what kind of problems almost always lead to uh, a revision request. And then we uh, further checked to what extent these problems are present in published papers and we compared published papers also against their methods review template to see what kind of issues are uh, slipped through during the review process. And I will give the stage now to Henny Tenhunen, who will explain, who will tell you some of the descriptive uh, results from our study. And then I will continue after her and explain some of the more specific issues uh, with some examples, and then also what we can do to avoid these specific issues. So I'll, I'll, I'll switch to another presentation now, and then Henny can continue. Thank you, Mikko, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Henny Tenhunen, and uh, um, a doctoral con candidate at Aalto University, Department of Industrial Engineering and Management, and. Uh, I would now like to tell you a little bit about the results of this uh, twofold review we did about the common methodological problems in operations management and uh, concerning the editor letters and published studies in Journal of Operations Management. And my co-author uh, is, uh, as Mikko said, Gabriela Latikainen. Uh, she's from uh, Jyväskylä University also. Okay. So uh, I guess the, the inspiration or the background for doing this uh, type of review was one recent paper published in Organizational uh, Research Methods by Jennifer Green. And uh, in this paper, uh, they looked at uh, the review process and what kind of issues could be found that lead to either rejection or revision uh, of these manuscripts. And uh, there is, uh, previous studies, but they haven't been as comprehensive as, as this study. And so it gave us a kind of a roadmap or idea how to conduct this, this review. Uh, although our study design was uh, a bit different, we had study one and study two, as Mikko told you, 
And uh, in the study one, we focused on the review process and looked at these uh, decision letters by editors um, and a couple of review reports as well from 2018 uh, to first half of 2019. And we had around uh, 88, we had uh, 88 documents, uh, letters that um, uh, co concerned 80 manuscripts. That was our unit of analysis. And uh, from these 80 manuscripts, 42 were invited for revision and 38 were rejected. And we used uh, Atlas TI for coding this with Gabriela Latkainen. And uh, because these uh, letters were uh, written by Mikko, so he wasn't involved in, in this coding stage of, of the letters. Um, and we, we tried to be more objective that way. And our goal was to identify common problems and uh, whether they lead to rejection or revision and <clears throat> what we could learn um, helpful things for uh, authors, uh, scientists to, to take into consideration when they plan their studies. And then uh, after this, we, uh, we uh, wanted to see uh, previously published studies in Journal of Operations Management and if we could find uh, similar issues there, same problems that were discovered in the, the first study. And uh, we did the review of uh, 46 uh, empirical theory testing articles published uh, in 2016 to 2018 in the journal and uh, reviewed against this method checks template and also the findings and code structure that was developed in study one uh, against this, uh, these papers. And we did then some comparison of issues discovered um, in study one and study two. Uh, we excluded uh, predictive, uh, um, predictive modeling papers and those that used machine learning. And uh, we focused on empirical theory testing articles. Uh, our analysis uh, was uh, based on constant comparative method. It was an iterative uh, analysis we did. Uh, we started with open coding where we were really looking at the expression, expressions in the letters and uh, tried to be as open uh, to the issues and, and problems that could be discovered. And um, uh, after that, we uh, discussed uh, between the, the co-author and uh, then we did more coding and, and tried to discover the commonalities between um, the, the issues we discovered and then build some conceptual categories uh, that, are, uh, dis that were discovered in this um, operations management review process regarding research methods. And that was uh, uh, the next coding phase. And we started uh, to, to notice that um, some main groups uh, emerged uh, that had to do with uh, either research design issues or uh, data analysis, and then somewhere about interpretation and, and reporting mostly. So we decided to, to divide uh, or use as, as the next stage of our coding these three main groups uh, that, that are here, research design issues, data analysis issues, and reporting issues. And after that, we went again back to the, the letters and we started, uh, we did another round of coding where we then built uh, a code structure using hierarchical codes, where we had, for example, uh, research design as the, the main group or uh, main category. Then we had causality as the subcategory, and then a specific uh, topic, for example, control variables. And uh, in the study two, we used the same code book that was developed. And uh, then we, in addition, uh, we had descriptive codes that we checked for each uh, paper, whether what kind of analysis they had and, and so on. Um, 
Then uh, after this, uh, we realized that there were some uh, overlaps uh, with the, the DA and uh, reporting codes. So we organized these uh, into technique, justification, and interpretation and reporting issues. So finally, we had four categories of problems. So here are these four uh, categories. Uh, in addition to research design problems, we looked at if techniques or we discovered that in the letters, uh, there, there was this persistent issue of whether the techn uh, techniques were uh, used correctly. Um, justification was one of the themes that rose and uh, also interpretation and reporting were the fourth one. Uh, let's go to the results then. So study uh, first, uh, here are some uh, results regarding the research design issues. So the first, uh, the most common, uh, three most common issues in this category uh, where that uh, research design does not support causal claims. Uh, control variables are, are, missing, uh, are missing or observational study claims causality or we have cross-sectional study with med mediation model. Um, common method variance was also very common. <laughs> so there was no proper diagnostics for that. And it was uh, clearly visible and mentioned in the letters. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, problematic measures uh, where there was no clear scale development or adaptation approach where uh, one of the most common research, research design issues in the editor letters mentioned regarding these manuscripts. So that was uh, that category. Then regarding, regarding the techniques and, and their use. So uh, this is a bit weird because we, we have now in a, inappropriate technique, but the, actually the most common issues in this category were that the, the appropriate techniques were missing. So uh, model fit analysis were missing. Uh, if there was significant chi-square statistic, uh, it should have been noted and uh, diagnosed as, as SEM analysis, SEM analysis uh, should, should be more extensive or they were missing completely. And then also um, missing common method variance analysis was also a problem. There were also incorrect use of, of techniques, but these two were the most common in this category. So it was about missing techniques uh, more than uh, inappropriate use. Uh, then justification issues. Uh, here often mentioned was that uh, assumptions of Kronbach alpha uh, were not checked when assessing reliability or some uh, uh, justification of uh, reliability methods were not convincing uh, or they were completely missing. Uh, re regression assumptions were not checked enough. So this was mentioned uh, a lot. And um, these were maybe not the, the severe issues that led to, to rejection, but they were very common uh, and mentioned a lot in the letters. Then interpretation and reporting issues. So uh, Justification of control variables. The selection of control variables uh, was very common. And uh, uh, it was mentioned that uh, there, there should be more justification why the control variable uh, presents an alternative uh, explanation for the correlation between the dependent and independent variable, and not just why it affects the dependent variable. Uh, a lot of then these reporting problems, such as text revision and problems with tables and figures, they weren't uh, clear. There were some, some uh, scales missing, some numbers, values, or colors were uh, a bit off and, and so on. Also, um, then uh, one of the issues was that more details were needed on model fit. Uh, in particular, uh, the model misspecification should be reported in more detail. Um, so, then uh, this is a like first descriptive uh, uh, analysis or kind of a overview of what are the most common uh, uh, issues that lead to typically lead to rejection in, in this sample we had. And 
the the highest one, the most common one, was that research design does not support causal claims. And uh, it was very frequent in the rejected manuscripts, and it had uh, the manuscripts having the issue had a high rejection rate. Uh, then also uh, data collection and sampling uh, issues were quite severe regarding their rejection rate. Um, and then missing common method analysis were, were also, also uh, one of the most common ones. Of course, uh, this is interesting that many should have justified methodological choices based on their merits uh, instead of empirical present. So that was among the top four in these rejection decision manuscripts that we discovered. But then uh, uh, what uh, problems seem to lead to revision decision? Well, uh, these had low rejection rate manuscripts that had these four issues. They were very common. Many papers uh, that were invited for revision had them. Uh, here's model fit, additional details were needed. Endogeneity issues were in many papers. Um, and then uh, the editor uh, also complained about choosing inappropriate, inappropriate technique for addressing uh, common method variants and about the missing regression diagnostics. And then instrumental variables uh, were not uh, justified enough, but these were not, uh, did not seem to lead to uh, re rejection so much. They, they went to the next stage and, and that was our discovery. Okay, then uh, after this, uh, we continued uh, towards the published papers. And I'm gonna tell a little bit about these published papers that we reviewed. So um, mostly, mo uh, most of the papers had secondary data uh, and they were longitudinal. Uh, there were some cross-sectional surveys also, and uh, most had some kind of linear model and they, many used also instrumental variables and uh, multi-level models were also quite, quite common. Uh, there weren't that many experiments um, and not that many uh, structural equation models either. And uh, there were 46 uh, <clears throat> papers altogether that we looked. And what was clear was that uh, there, there were <laughs> not that many uh, diagnostics done in these papers. So, 70% had none, uh, not anything on diagnostics. 22% uh, had some, and there were some really good examples of, of doing the diagnostics well, uh, but only 9%. And then um, most of the papers only looked at the, the significance and did not really uh, interpret the, the effect size, the, the practical importance of the effect. So uh, this review revealed uh, several things on the same four uh, problem uh, categories that we had in, the, in study one. Uh, firstly, the most common research design issue uh, was uh, causality, claiming causality with the problematic research design. Um, uh, sorry, uh, problematic research design giving possibility to endogeneity, sorry. Um, that was the most common uh, research design problem. We didn't have that many papers uh, here that had uh, research design issues overall, and endogeneity was the most common problem in these. Um, but the second one was claiming causality and how uh, cross-section or, or some other uh, problems in the research design, not necessarily cross-sectional, design was causing problems, for example, problems with control variables and then uh, uh, inappropriate uh, instruments or time lag. Then um, problematic measures uh, were also uh, discovered uh, here in study two and common method variance was also 
uh, somewhat common, but uh, not really. Like if you look at the numbers, so only only a handful had these issues. Uh, in inappropriate techniques. So here <laughs> again, we had missing techniques that that was the most common problem discovered. And here we did this review of, of these papers so that uh, Gabriela and I uh, first we split the, the papers in half and then uh, used the methods check template, went through these papers and then uh, discussed them with Mikko. So then we Mikko went through all the papers and this was uh, how we found these, uh, these issues. So um, Miss, missing regression related analysis was the, the most common technique related problem, especially missing diagnostics. And then there were also many incorrect uh, use of actual re regression, like the main models. Uh, for example, two stage least squares uh, was used uh, incorrectly. Uh, the residuals were used instead of fitted values. And there were also many other uh problems uh regarding different types of regression models and uh instrumental variables were also quite challenging in in some papers 10 papers here it seems um and they they had some uh, problems with the criteria and selection of and use of of them in different models and then model fit analysis were missing as well um, Justification uh, didn't have that many. Uh, Eleven seems to be the, the count of, of the, the most common problem. So unsubstantiated claim about regression was the most common uh, justification problem. And this concerned mostly about uh, transforming variables so that regression uh, could fulfill their um, assumptions, normality assumption, for example. So it was claimed uh, that it requires also normally distributed variables. And these types of uh, also like log transformation, when is it needed? And uh, uh, then in relation to regression model, uh, yeah, justification, lack of justification. So in some papers, there were no uh, justification at all why they did the log transformation for, for the focal variables in regression. and. Um, this was this was a problem in in some of these papers, um, and also a lack of justification regarding instrumental variables. So we have the relevance criterion and then the exclusion criterion. So these were uh, often not or not not so often, but ra rather often uh, kind of uh, ignored. And finally, then interpretation and reporting issues. Uh, so uh, here is the same as in study one, uh, control variables. Uh, there's a lack of justification regarding control variables and also relying on um, empirical papers as, as a justification for, for using some methods. So these were the main issues in uh, problematic justification of metal methodological choices or control variables. So that was the, the largest uh, issue. Uh, citations had problems, especially page numbers missing from book citations and uh, text revision was needed. Uh, to conclude study, study two, um, we could say that um, Regression related issues uh, seem to be the most common uh, if we look at analysis and technique things and mostly about justifying uh, your choices uh, and, and kind of misunderstandings about how to choose the technique, what to do with the variables and, and then how to, what to report, uh, what is relevant uh, so that the, the readers get a good understanding of your results and your models. Um, we did comparison between study one and study two. Uh, and you can see here that there is a difference between the research design issues that were most common in these studies. So uh, in, 
in this uh, manuscript uh, methods check uh, stage, of course, there are more severe uh, research design problems uh, that have to do with causality. So that was the most common uh, problem there. Causality uh, claims are not supported by the research design. So uh, these type of issues, um, of course, uh, when they haven't gone through the, uh, the peer review and the methods check, so that's why they, they were there. But then in, in the published articles, naturally, there are no longer grave uh, research design problems, but endogeneity still persists. So there are still uh, omitted variable bias or simultaneity based endogeneity left or some other, other types of endogeneity. Uh, then regarding the technique, uh, here both uh, studies had missing analysis, whether it's model fit or diagnostics, similar things. Other had uh, published that it had uh, clearly uh, these diagnostics are missing and uh, or, or in many cases, regression diagnostics were missing. And then justifications, uh, study one were about reliability, assessing that, and then study two, um, were about regression mostly. And what was surprisingly similar is that both these manuscripts and then the published papers had similar problems that uh, with the justification of control variables, why are they chosen? What do they bring to the model? And, and what kind of, um, how do they address endogeneity? Uh, but then also this uh, justification of methodological choices uh, was uh, found to be quite common problem in these published papers. Okay, so those were the, the main results of study one and study two. And what we can conclude at this stage when we have these preliminary descriptive uh, results is that it seems that uh, JOM review is, is very good at identifying research design problems and uh, that works well. There aren't that many uh, problems except endogeneity, but then there's room for improvement regarding um, some data analysis and justification issues such as these control variables and other things that I just mentioned. Okay, thank you. So now I will give floor back to Mikko. Okay, I'll uh, say a few words about Henny's presentation before uh, we go to my final presentation where I take a look at a couple of more specific issues with examples and uh, then what we can do about it. Let's go back uh, one slide here. And um, by the way, I was, I was thinking that I would go on for uh, 40 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes for discussion at the end. So if we compare this, this study one, uh, the rejected manuscripts or manuscripts that uh, were in the methods check review and were asked to be revised and these accepted manuscripts, we have to also understand that this is a, these are, are quite different kinds of papers. So uh, the majority of articles that come in, at least to the methods check are cross-sectional surveys. And those are difficult to publish in the journal. We do publish those if they are really well done and if they address interesting questions. But as Henny pointed out in the beginning of the presentation, most of the published studies actually use secondary data. So when you use secondary data, then for example, addressing scale reliability is, is not an issue. So that's, that's one reason why these, these results differ. Another thing that must be pointed out is that like Henny said, not all of these issues are equally severe. And uh, one thing that I like to point out particularly is there are Cronbach's alpha. So if, if you misapply it, then the consequences are not that severe, but it's, it's very easy to apply correctly. And to check the assumptions, you simply need to do factor analysis. If the factor loadings are the same or roughly the same for all the items, then you apply coefficient alpha. If they differ, then you apply composite reliability and, and that's it. Uh, so that's something that anyone can do. 
So it's easy to fix, and that's one of the reasons why it's, it's uh, often raised. And people don't seem to know much about the assumptions of our. But it's not an important issue. It's just something that is uh, easy to spot and easy to fix, and therefore it's, it's highlighted here. I'll now go through uh, some of the more specific issues with uh, examples and then uh, talk about how we can avoid these methodological problems. All right, so uh, back to my presentation and uh, we were initially planning on having uh, the first draft of the full paper that explains these issues that I will go through now for the conference participants. But because of the pandemic, uh, it didn't turn out. So we didn't have time to write it because of having to homeschool kids and, and other stuff like that. But uh, we, we have a version, we just need to clean it up and it'll be available uh, on the conference website in a, a couple of days, maybe hopefully Monday, definitely by Wednesday. So, so let's take a look at um, what uh, issues we have. And uh, the increase in the methodological rigor really started uh, during the tenure of the previous editors in chief. So there was this uh, editorial by Keto Kibi and Guide, or Guide and Keto Kibi rather, and uh, they pointed out, out some problems. And we can see that the problems that they actually pointed out uh, have uh, become more salient to authors that submit papers to the journals. So Guide and Ketakivi pointed out that it's time to take causality seriously. And uh, they talked about the endogeneity. And actually quite a few papers that are submitted to the journal talk about the endogeneity. The problem is that not all those papers actually know how to apply instrument variables correctly. Some don't seem to really know what an instrumental variable is. And uh, trying to uh, deal with endogeneity without understanding what the issue is about and uh, what instrumental variables it really are or what two states least squares or an, any other instrumental variable estimation technique does uh, leads to trouble. So this uh, recommendation time to take causality seriously has actually led to uh, another set of problems because it forces uh, researchers to apply tools that they may not be comfortable with. And uh, rule of, of thumb, that is still very much prevalent. So I, have, I don't think that that editorial from five years ago really made any difference. So we get lots of papers that still say that when reliability statistic is over 0 0.0, 0 0.7, then everything is fine. When it's below, then results are useless. Always understand the tools that you use. This is a problem, and, and we can see this both in published articles and in the article sent to meta treatment. I, I'll demonstrate an, I'll show an example with two states least squares, but we had applications uh, that claim to be two states or three states least squares. And when the authors explained the, the method, their explanation was not even close to what the two states or least squares, three states least squares is actually doing. There were claims about how one test testing efficiency doesn't do that. It assumes efficiency tests for consistency. And uh, GMM is presented as a general method for dealing with endogeneity. Well, GMM does not deal with any kinds of endogeneity. And uh, even if you are using it with the dynamic panel model, it deals only with specific kinds. So, so that kind of things, uh, this uh, editorial really uh, seems to have pushed people uh, beyond their comfort zone in using techniques that would be effective if used correctly, but then uh, you, whether those are used correctly, that's entirely another matter. Common method bias, this is something that most articles address, but it's, it's really uh, a big can of worms in that many of those techniques that are recommended for common method variance, if you really look at, at what they are based on and what's the idea, and does it really work? The answer to that tends to be either no or yes, but only in very specific circumstances. So if you have method variance problem, you basically have options uh, that are really bad, bad, and 
slightly bad. So, so there are no, no good solutions to method variance problems. So we need to understand that when we deal with method variance problems. So quite often we have Harman single factor test, unmeasured latent variable and so on. And then stay current with methodological development. This is not being followed that well. So quite often people justify their choices because this is what has been done in the past. I remember particularly one paper that I, I think I send a, a revision request last week or, or sometimes in the recent past. And uh, I asked the authors to, uh, to justify their decisions based on, on methodological literature. And then I pointed to a uh, literature that states and, and demonstrates that what the authors actually do is problematic, even though it's a current convention. And then I got a, a response back from them saying that we are doing this because it's a convention to do so. So not all conventions are worth following. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of highlights on, on the problems that we have. And uh, I'm probably not going to have time to go through all the things that I prepared. So I tend to have more slides than I go through, but I'll post the slides uh, on the conference website. And I also have most of these slides that I used here explained uh, on, on YouTube, and I'll, I'll point you the links later. So instrument of variables and endogeneity. This is a paper. This is a screenshot from a manuscript that uh, was revised a couple of times during the method review process. And uh, it's, it's now sufficiently different that you can identify what manuscript or what, what published paper this is actually. So, so what is the problem here? So uh, they're regressing x on z. z is instrument, x is endogenous x planetary variable. So stage one, that's the first stage of two states least squares. Well, it's good that far. And uh, z is related to x. Well, that's an assumption in instrument of variable estimation. Good to check. So correctly this far. And then uh, use regression residuals as an instrument of variable for x in the second stage regression analysis. That's actually not how you do two stage least squares. So in two stage least squares, you are supposed to uh, have an instrument of variable. I explained the concept in a few slides from now. Then regress the endogenous variable on the instrument of variable, take the fitted value, not the residual, and then use the fitted value in place of the original endogenous variable as a predictor of why the dependent variable. So uh, they're, they're applying it incorrectly. And uh, what is the justification for this application? They are citing by 2016, Wang 2016. And when we take a look at what Bai and Wang published in Journal of Operations Management actually say, they explain the two stage least squares procedure similarly incorrect. So the point here is, is not to blame any author. So these are mistakes that everyone makes. The, the point is that maybe if you want to know how two stage least squares works, Journal of Operations Management is maybe not the best place to look. So instead of looking at uh, Journal of Operations Management, maybe you should be looking at a really good research methods book or an econometrics book that is specifically about these kind of techniques. Now, are these incorrect applications or are they just incorrect explanations of a correct application? We don't know. If they are incorrect applications, of course, these are the main analysis of these papers. The results are going to be completely incorrect. If it's just a reporting issue, the results could be right. We don't know. How would we know? Well, we would know if the authors were just to uh, explain, for example, that they used a uh, status IV regress command, or even better, tell us, uh, give us the analysis file. So if you give the analysis file that you applied, then we can check what you actually did. And we don't have to rely on whether uh, you know what two states least cross does. Another thing uh, that we can learn from this example is that if you are not 100% sure how, for example, two states least cross works, then maybe you should not try to explain what it does. Just state that you apply two states least cross and state the software, perhaps report the command as well and be done with it. So then, then you're not uh, giving incorrect advice to other authors. So uh, 
how did I respond to this kind of uh, problem? Well, this is uh, from the decision letter. And uh, quite often when I write decisions, I, I tend to, uh, to link to teaching slides or teaching videos. So I have this uh, library of, of things that you can find on YouTube, about 200 small clips that they explain different techniques. So instead of, uh, of looking at general operations management, perhaps you should look at Ketokivian Macintosh. Well, it's in general of operations management. It's specifically about these techniques. Or take a look at economic metrics. Or take a look at our lecture video that explains the concept. Don't use journal for persons management and empirical papers published in, in the journal as methodological guidance. So the fact that people use something probably correlates with that technique being useful. But simply the fact that something has been used in the past is not evidence for the usefulness of that approach. Because not all the techniques that are applied work well. Or we might later discover that some of the techniques that we have applied in the past don't really work as well as we thought that they do. So this happens as well. And uh, this is very much about staying up to date with the current methodological departments. So, but we should not feel too bad about this because this happens to everybody. For example, uh, industrial marketing management published uh, a paper that explains Tuesday's least course incorrectly in the same exact way. And what's worse is that this is actually a paper about how to deal with endogeneity. So uh, a journal publishes a paper about how to deal with endogeneity when you write your articles to that journal and they explain things incorrectly. Now, there was a, a follow-up to this paper by the same authors who say that, well, we explained it incorrectly, and then they provide the correct explanation. But if you simply see this paper, which is uh, somewhat cited now, you wouldn't know that there's a correction being published. So uh, whenever you see something uh, in an applied journal, it might be a good idea to take a methods book or look at a class that it talks about methods and then compare. It does the methods book or does the class explain the method the same way than an article published in an applied journal does. And by applied, I mean, art, uh, I mean journals that publish empirical research instead of journals that publish studies about methods. So, so this is an instance of, uh, instance of uh, a statistical method, uh, methodological myth and urban legend. So the idea of, of these methodological myths is that someone publishes an idea in an econometrics book we, we read that there is uh, two regressions in two states least squares. We take something from the first stage, we use that in the second stage, and uh, you misunderstand that, well, we, we take the fitted value, residuals instead of the fitted values, and then you publish a paper in an applied journal. Then instead of looking at the original idea in the research methods journal, people tend to look at the journal where they want to publish. So, one person misunderstands an idea from a research methods journal, then it starts to circulate within that discipline or within the journal. And this is what we actually saw in the Tuesday's least course exam. When this goes on for a while, it becomes institutionalized in the review process. So when reviewers see someone explaining that we use Tuesday's least course, we used uh, regressed X on Z, we took the fitted values, we use those to predict why. A reviewer says, no, that's not how Tuesday's least course is used. See these five papers published in this journal that explain, this journal that explain how Tuesday's least course works. So the problem is that once we have enough misapplication, then trying to publish a correct application becomes more difficult. And then it becomes part of the methodological body of the discipline to do things wrong. So how do we stop this kind of problem? So how do we stop these statistical and methodological myths and urban legends? There is actually um, some good advice in the 2015 editorial by Guy and Keta Kivi. One is that you should always understand the techniques that you apply. So instead of simply reading what Journal of Operations Management does, take a look at what actual methodological literature says about it. Instead of saying, 
that expert X recommends technique Y, you should be uh, justifying your decisions based on that method, uh, that the method has been proven to be something. If Tuesday's list has been proven to be consistent, it's a much stronger claim than saying that Gaiden and Ketokivi recommend Tuesday's list course. If you can also say simul simul uh, simulation studies have demonstrated that method X does something. You should not use something because someone has said so. The fact that I say that you should use Tuesday's least squares is not a justification. You need to justify things based on their proven or demonstrated properties. If you think that regression analysis is problematic for your study, then you need to say that regression analysis has been proven to be inconsistent, which means that it produces incorrect results even with very large samples under endogeneity. And then you can say that, well, Tuesday's least course has been proven to be consistent under this scenario, therefore we apply Tuesday's least course. Another problem is citing methodological source, or another solution is citing methodological sources instead of citing previous applications. And whenever you, uh, you cite something which people actually do, remember to add page numbers to the citation. So one of the things that I often see is that authors say that they apply Tuesday's least squares and they cite Green 2010, for example. Well, Green's econometrics book is 1,200 pages. How am I supposed to know what specific thing from that book, which covers a really broad range of topics, are you referring to? So whenever you cite something, uh, particularly a big book, give your reviewers and, and your readers pointers on where to learn more about this technique that you apply. Just citing green will not help anyone because no one who has uh, not read green from cover to cover will know what you are referring to. And if someone has read green from cover to cover, they are probably somewhere teaching econometrics because that's a really hard book to read. Publisher analysis part. So the, the problem here was that we don't really know whether Tuesday's least course was applied incorrectly or simply explained incorrectly. If you publish your analysis file, stata do file, SPSS uh, syntax file, stata r file, then your readers and your reviewers can actually check if you did things correctly. Doing things incorrectly versus do explaining things incorrectly are very two very different kinds of problems. One is easy to solve, just fix the explanation. But if your actual main analysis is done incorrectly, then a lot of rework is uh, in order to make it work. So really pay attention to how you justify things and try to understand what you do. And this goes beyond Tuesday's list course. I One of the articles that was published in uh, and that were reviewed did a study or a model where X predicted Y, Y predicted X, and then they applied seemingly underrated regressions technique to that. Well, that's not the correct technique, and it's in violation of that technique's assumptions. It produces very much incorrect results if you do that. This relates to knowing what you do and also explaining it in a transparent way. So this is one of the problems. Another specific problem is um, relates to uh, instrument variable and endogeneity. And there are a couple of myths that need to be corrected that are very common in the published studies. Let's take a look at what endogeneity is. So the idea of endogeneity is that if you want to regress y and x and claim causality so that x is a cause of y, then you must assume that any other causes of y are uncorrelated with x. So there are basically three causes of endogeneity that one could think of. One is that you have a specific omitted cause in, in your mind. So you might, might know that variable E here is a cause of X and Y, but you don't have data for E. Maybe you have prior theory that says that E causes X and Y, you don't have data. So this is an omitted control variable problem and uh, it needs to be explained. Another problem is that you're not sure if, if one of the omitted causes, other causes of Y could be correlated with X. So you don't know the specific source of endogeneity, but you assume that X and Y are correlated more than what can be attributed to this possible causal relationship. 
The third kind, which is a bit different, is that there's reciprocal causation so that X causes Y and Y causes X. And this is called simultaneity in econometrics. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at an example of, of what this means in practice. So let's assume that we have this kind of simple problem. We want to um, study if investments in factories affects return on assets. And uh, what kind of assumptions do we need to make? This relates to uh, the paper by McIntosh and Ketokivi about endogeneity, which is a very good uh, general explanation of this. And they state that addressing the endogeneity question starts with uh, asking the question, what does the variance, what explains the variance of the dependent variable? So what does investment in factories depends on? Some companies invest in factories, others don't. What does it depend on? Well, it could depend on, on company strategy. So investments in new factory strategic decision probably depends on firm strategy. So if we assume that firm strategy is one of the predictors of whether a company decides to invest in a new factory or not, then to claim that there is no endogeneity, we must assume that firm strategy is not the cause of return on assets. If you go and say that return on assets does not influence, uh, or firm strategy does not influence return on assets, and you go and, and tell that to strategy management scholars, they will tell you to go away because there's lots of evidence that strategy actually influences ROI. So we have an endogeneity problem when the variance of the explanatory variable depends on something that also causes the dependent variable. And, and the key thing in, in dealing with endogeneity is to first explain to the readers what really is the endogeneity problem about in your study. Quite often, when I see study, review studies, they just state that there is potential endogeneity problem. That's not very useful. It's the uh, same kind of statement that our study could be potentially wrong. Our sample could be potentially biased. Our measures could be potentially invalid. Yes, all those are logical possibilities, but we should also only focus on, on those possible problems that we think are most relevant. And therefore, we need to really try to understand what is the specific issue in our case. So, so what is the thing that drives investment in factories that also drives ROA, explain to the readers, and then you move on to the next stage, which is how to deal with endogen. So, so this is problem number one. Claim, making a general claim that endogeneity is a problem without explaining what really is the problem about. Some studies do it well. So they, they say that, uh, uh, and those fall into the class, typically that are uh, the, the endogeneity class where there is a reciprocal causation. So ROA causes investment as well. And then they can explain how to deal with the problem. The general strategy for dealing with this problem is uh, using instrumental value. The idea of an instrumental variable is that you pick something that correlates with the endogenous explanatory variable and does not correlate with the error term. There are problems in instrumental variables in the studies that I've reviewed and some of the published studies. Two specific problems. One is that studies are justifying this instrumental variable by checking if it correlates with Y as seeing that that correlation is non-significant, then declaring that Z is a valid instrument. That's not the right thing to, thing, thing to test. You need to uh, test somehow whether Z correlates with the unobserved error term, which you have, of course can't do directly because you don't observe the error term. If you did, then uh, things would be very simple. So the Z must be justified that it does not correlate with any other causes, it mu must be justified based on a theory. And this is the second problem. The first thing when you deal with endogeneity is to explain the problem. The second thing that you must do is to explain why you think that your chosen instruments based on existing theory or based on existing empirical research are not causes of the dependent variable. If they are, then they're not valid instruments. So here's a list of common problems about endogeneity and instrumental variables. Not explaining the nature of the exogeneity problem, endogeneity problem. Not justifying the instrumental exclusion criteria. These were the one 
two things that I just explained. Assuming that Tuesday's estimates, least course estimator is required for dealing with n to Tuesday's least course is a simple technique for dealing with n to but it's not the only technique. There are the, the magic ingredient in endogeneity is not Tuesday's least course. It's an instrumental variable. And uh, you can, of course, use instrumental variables with structural ecosystem models. I've seen quite a few papers that use structural ecosystem modeling with latent variables, then switch to, observe, uh, to scale scores and apply Tuesday's least course. This is unnecessary. It's a bit incorrect if you apply if you assume that the latent variable model is actually correct for the data, and it's also unnecessary complex because you can simply add an instrumental variable to the structural ecosystem modeling directly. It doesn't make much difference to the original model. Assuming that GMM estimator solves endogeneity problems, or assuming that it, when used with a dynamic panel technique, solves all endogeneity problems. So this is something that we encountered in published studies. And this is an example of a complex technique being either justified incorrectly or even outright misapplied. Implementing statistical techniques incorrectly, two states to course incorrect implementation, we just saw one. Another thing that is commonly misused is three states list course. I think uh, that the applications of three states list course that I've seen in this journal are more often incorrect than correct or at least they're incorrectly explained, whether it's actually done incorrectly or whether the explanation is simply incorrect, we don't know. Assuming that correlation between instrument and dependent variable is a test of the exclusion criteria. So, so this is the, um, the endogeneity. It's a, it's a big, big minefield. And one of the reasons why I think uh, researchers are struggling with this is that they may not have uh, training for dealing with endogeneity, because this issue has really been highlighted only in the, about last 10 years, and it was raised in an editorial five years ago. And if you were not given training on how to deal with endogeneity, if you did not take an econometrics class during your doctoral studies, it might, might, might be possible that the first time that you are uh, here that you need to do something about endogeneity is when you get a review letter back from the journal telling that you need to deal with endogeneity and gives you 90 days to uh, submit a revised version. Is it a reasonable thing to assume that the researcher first learns about instrumental variables and endogeneity, then learns about two stage least squares, other techniques for, the, for using these instrumental variables, then applies them correctly, reports them correctly, and does this within, the nine, within 90 days? Probably not. So if you are asked to do something, uh, that you are not really comfortable with, it might be a good idea to uh, do two things. One, you can ask more time. You can tell the editor that the reviewers are asking you to do something which you have never done before. Therefore, you need more time to study. You'll, you'll get the extension, no problem, unless it's a special issue and there's a time limit. The second thing that you can do is to write in the response letter that this is the first time that, that we do two test listers please check if we have done this correctly. No reasonable editor or reviewer will tell, uh, reject your paper because you are misapplying technique that you are now using the first time. If uh, you, you misapplied once, you're told to, mis, uh, to fix it, and you misapply it again, then you're likely going to be rejected. The data analysis issues or mistakes are generally something that can be addressed in revisions. Of course, if it seems that uh, a paper would need five revisions before it can reach acceptable level on the methods part, then uh, we will not do those five reviews. We'll tell you to, uh, to go elsewhere with your paper or, or make it better and then come back once you're sure that it's better. So, so we can't run a research methods 101 or advanced research methods uh, course during the review process for one set of orders. So that's a simply a resource in question. Okay, we got still some time. So I'll talk about another common problem, method variance. And uh, method variance is, uh, this is a, a big, big can of worms. So whenever we get a cross-sectional survey, we basically require that the author say something about method variance. But whether, you can actually show that it's not a problem or 
whether you can show that it's it whether we don't really know whether it's generally a problem or not. There are theories that method variants can influence correlations between observed variants. Whether is there evidence to support those theories? That's a big iffy thing. But nevertheless, uh, this has been and it continues to be a common reason for rejection. So if all your scales, all your scale items in your survey are highly correlated, then it's possible that the correlation is driven by something else than the constructs of interest. And that's the basic argument for rejecting an article because of method variance problems. So what can you actually do about method variance problems? There are Editorial by Guide and Ketakivi points you to Pochak of 2003. But this is an instance of pointing to outdated advice. So this is a, a, a topic that is actively studied. So within the last five years, we've had lots of important and interesting findings in the research methodology literature that you need to look at. So if you justify things based on Pochak of 2003, then you are using outdated information. So there are a couple of techniques that you can apply. And um, these techniques for method variance issues can be uh, divided into techniques that detect the problem. If you use a technique that detects a problem, then the technique tells you that there's no problem, you're fine. Then we have techniques that detect and control. So if you have method variance problem, there are ways of controlling for it. So uh, we have correlational techniques, Harman single factor test, not, should not be used. Keto, uh, Kiwi, and Guide point to that already. Pochak of 2003, 20 years ago, says don't use that test. Still, when I see that test being used, it's typically justified with a citation to Pochak of 2003. So, so authors are using technique and citing an article that specifically recommends against the use of that technique. So that either indicates that uh, the authors have not really read Pochak of 2003, or they are simply being uh, a bit dishonest. I think they are not reading the paper is the more common scenario. Then there are parts of correlation procedures, Lindelar with the technique and unmeasured latent method factor design, which is also explained in Potsakov's paper. So this is one technique. And, and these are techniques that you could apply without thinking about method variance issues in your study design. So these are some things that you could apply after the data has been collected. The other techniques that are available require that you think about the technique, in, uh, about the method variance problem in advance. We have marker variable techniques and measure techniques. The idea of a marker variable is that you uh, measure something completely unrelated. For example, you measure a person's uh, mood on that day in your survey about uh, supply chains, and then if you can check if the mood variable correlates with the supply chain variables. If they do, then uh, that's an indication of method variables. So this is the idea of, of um, marker variables and measured techniques refers to techniques where you are, are suspecting that some of the items in your study are influenced by, for example, uh, social desirability bias. And then you have a uh, a scale about social desirability, and, and then you use that in the model. We have a couple of techniques that apply this principle. Then we have multiple method techniques. So uh, if you think that measurement method drives correlations, then use multiple methods. So multi-trade, multi-method matrices is the most common methodological approach for analyzing the data. These are not very common. So these are basically techniques where you measure the same dependent variable, same independent variable using two independent measures. And then we have instrument variable techniques. And this is something that is not, I've never seen anyone applying this, but it's recommended in some articles and it's in principle useful. These techniques can be characterized also into questionable techniques and impractical question techniques. So instrument variables are impractical because if you have an instrument variable, it must be uncorrelated with the source of error. And if you think that, for example, uh, using a survey and a single informant is a source of error, then your instrument variable must be collected from some other informant or using some other technique with the same informant. And that's typically not practical. The reason for using a single informant surveys is typically that no other 
form of data collection is available for particular research questions. Impractical and questionable multi method, multi trade techniques. I will not explain that in detail because this is not really used in, uh, in JOM papers. Then we have questionable techniques. So, correlation techniques are the most common of these techniques is that you uh, have a, a converter factor analysis model where you have the latent variables of interest and then you have one general method factor that loads on, on which all the indicators load. This is uh, these kind of models are rarely identified. Identification means that it's mathematically possible to come with the best set of estimates for the model. And if the model is not identified, then estimating the model is, is rather useless. So these are really, really questionable techniques. I'll talk more about this on, on a YouTube video that I'll link to. Marker variables, this is, this is the state of the art and it bit it's, still a bit questionable because you're making assumptions that we really don't know if they hold, but it's, it could work at least in theory. So these models are not typically identified. They don't work even in ideal conditions. This is a bit less questionable. It can work in ideal conditions. Whether it works in practice, we don't know. So practical advice on method variants. This is something that uh, is, Evolving, so there is lots of methodological literature addressing these issues, and uh, you can take a look at, for example, Spectre's paper from 2019. This is a very good article about uh, measure, how measurement method can affect indicators, and how you should be theorizing about the measurement method, and then how you should be analyzing the data once you have identified the possible causes of method variance. These are, this actually requires a lot of work if you apply the technique that they, they recommend, but I think that's the, uh, the most um, robust thing that you can actually use. So take a look at that article. Then uh, Potsakov and McKenzie is of course uh, classic and their recommendation for dealing with method variance is number one, the best way to deal with method variance is avoid the problem in the first place. So if you are asking about, uh, let's say, uh, supply chain integration and financial performance, two variables, then take financial performance measures from actual accounting figures, or ask the person to report numbers instead of rating the company's performance from, from one to five, people generally tend to report numbers like what's your revenue rather honestly, and they are not affected by the same kinds of biases that normal ratings get. So procedural remedies and multiple sources are best. Podzikov's article is still updated on this front. Consider mechanism and it is the expected effect. So, so what is actually, method is not something that is, is, is one source of variance. So there's social desirability, there's item priming, there is a leniency effect, implicit theories. Podzikov's article lists at least 20 different things that can cause two different indicators in the survey to correlate. Then our Spectre's article focuses on a few of those. So, and, and their main argument is that you should focus on the mechanism and then try to see how that mechanism influences your study. So what are priming effects, contextual effects? What's the mechanism? So this, this is something that you need to do before you collect your data. Then uh, consider evidence of strength of these effects in the methodological literature. If you're using a scale that has been shown to be very resistant, to, uh, let's say, social desirability bias. Then uh, you can write in your article that typically in this kind of study, social desirability would be the main problem. However, research has shown that for this particular scale that we apply, social desirability is not a big problem. That's one way to deal with method variance. Instead of trying to, uh, to fit a single method factor into the data, Try to think a bit more about what is actually driving the, the uh, correlation between the variables. And do you have any evidence to point to that shows that that might not be a problem in your study? Then you should make informed decisions and evaluate the impact based on, on this evidence that you've actually uh, read from about the prior applications in your study. This is basically um, the, uh, the procedure in a nutshell that Spectre and co-authors recommend. The correlation of techniques simply don't work. If you have a technique, have data that you collected, you did not think about method variance, and then you fit a single factor model to the data, 
doesn't really do any good. So these techniques don't work. Why they don't work, I'll, I'll explain in, in a set of videos that I'll link to next. So I have a few other topics uh, similar to this, but uh, because we need to wrap up the professional development workshop, I'm just going to skip these other things and then we'll uh, I say a few words and then we'll have a discussion about the, the things that we have shown here. So one thing that you can do is to learn more about these, these common problems is that you can go to my YouTube channel. So I, I do teach statistical research and research design, research methods. That's, that's my main competence. I'm not actually a operations management researcher myself. I consider myself more of a, a methods person. And I, I teach methods. And I decided uh, about a year ago that I will put all my lectures that I've done online on, on YouTube and uh, for the past about a year or year and a half, when I've been doing research methods courses, I've designed those courses to address uh, in part those issues that I've seen in, in the papers that I review for JOM. And uh, some of these, like uh, the set of videos on, on uh, method variance, well, I don't have a playlist for it yet, but there are like 10 videos is inspired by the problems that I, I saw in published articles. I, I show examples from uh, Journal of Operations Management and other journals. So this is one source where you can learn more about uh, the standards against which your articles are evaluated. And there is, there's more resources about these common problems coming soon. We will have our uh, paper that I work with uh, Henny and Gabi. And, um, the, the review part is done. We still need to write the recommendations. We'll have an early draft available on the conference website before the conference is over. And we'll submit a full paper explaining these issues and how to deal with them uh, later this fall. We hope that JOM will accept the paper and then publish it as soon as possible. And uh, then maybe once uh, we have this list of most common problems uh, explained, then maybe at that point uh, I'll write some editorials if there's something more that you should know. But this is just an explanation of some of the issues and what we can deal with the issues. The most important things, two most important things are, one, you should understand the techniques that you apply and your application should be based on the most recent methodological research instead of being based on what has been done in the past in journal of operations management. The two, the second important point is to be transparent. If you are not 100% sure whether you have answered the review question, reviewer comment correctly, then you should point out that out in the response there. Also, it's very useful to uh, provide your analysis files as part of supplementary material in the article. We don't insist that you publish those files as online supplementary material on the journal website, but they should be made available to the reviewers. Why is this important? Why is this useful for you? When I get an article to methods review, quite often the first, uh, revis first letter that I send to the authors is, I just need more information. You are not reporting transparently on what you do, so it is impossible for me to evaluate whether you're doing it correctly. Like the Tuesday's least course example in this presentation, we don't know if it's simply an incorrect explanation or whether it has been applied incorrectly too. Having access to the analysis files will solve a lot of problems and answer a lot of questions for those reviewers who actually have experience with that statistical software. I'll conclude my presentation here and we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and discussion now. So thank you very much, Miko, uh, for that very rich presentation. And I uh, very much appreciate 
uh, how people are coming together so that we can explain things well and make the get the most value out of the very exciting research that we do. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, I, Tyson and I feel that we want the journal to be held to the highest possible standard. It doesn't mean that we have created a new religion where you have to, you know, jump through certain hoops to be good enough, but it is really describing accurately what we have the right to say, um, you know, given the data that we have. And it might be that there is a possible, you know, a, a, a very likely endogeneity problem. And then just like you would do in a court of law explaining, you know, yes, this is, these are the factors that need to be taken into consideration. This is why this paper is worth looking at even though it could be biased in this direction, which also provides a leg up for, you know, for future researchers. Uh, so, uh, Guanji, it would be very interesting to have your comments if you're here. I, oh, sure. I, I, uh, I've seen you here. Yeah. So, uh, can you hear me? I think I did. Okay. Uh, we hear you. Okay, cool. Um, so, hi, everybody. Um, Thanks to editors for uh, inviting me on board on this uh, exciting department. And then I'll be very happy to work with Miko on these various issues. So it is also firsthand learning what Miko did in terms of the summary of uh, one and a half years work he has done basically. It's a quite structured summary. Um, so I think Miko's training is more from the uh, quant psychology and mine is a little more from econometrics. So we have this overlap on uh, how to deal with endogeneity. It seems to be one of the key topics uh, of today's talk. So I'm just gonna quickly echo uh, what Miko said and add my own reflection of this. So in my own reviews for the journal, as well as an author, I have to deal with this pretty much in every paper. So my reaction to this is I can understand uh, why endogeneity is such a, a thorny problem for authors and for reviewers as well, because it is easy to make a blanket statement saying that you have endogeneity problem and then feel that it's a slam dunk um, rejection for the paper, like Miko said. But to me, that feels more like an air ball than a slam dunk because uh, a more reasonable approach to dealing with and to talk about this is to first talk about what you think as the source of endogeneity, um, because otherwise it's placing an unreasonable burden on the authors if you don't tell them why you think there is an endogeneity problem in the first place. So I feel that's very important. And that also plays into uh, encouraging the authors to become more transparent and then encouraging the reviewer to become more reasonable because these two things, in my opinion, would have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, uh, it is unlikely that we will have a lot of improvement on this. On one hand, authors can be more transparent and then they wanna talk about uh, potential endogeneity problem and then what they think as the source of endogeneity and their proposed solution uh, in the first submission of the paper, that's the best scenario. But at the same time, I understand that if the authors do that, they might, open themselves to attacks on um, endless robustness checks and then at the end might lead to a rejection. But I feel that aspect could be improved if we ask the reviewers to be a little more reasonable in terms of uh, uh, you know, evaluating the solution of endogeneity. We don't need a perfect 100% perfection textbook solution to uh, your endogeneity problem because a lot of times the uh, instrumental variable in the uh, textbooks comes out of a simulation and then they would assume in the simulation that your instrument has no correlation with the error term and they, they observe the entire data generating process. Uh, that aspect I have to point out because in real world we do apply research where no textbook writers and then our data are not generated out of uh, simulations. We collect data and then the data collection process itself is extremely time consuming, regardless of your primary data collection or you actually contact the company 
to get the data. So I feel I need to respect that, your data collection effort. But also at the same time, I would like to echo Mikko's comment and then ask the authors to be a little um, kind of proactive when you are collecting the data. So you have gone through all the trouble to collect the data in the first place, right? So when you're collecting the data, try to think about endogeneity problem uh, when during the data collection process and then sort of uh, think about what might be the uh, cause of endogeneity, what might be the omitted variable if you didn't collect it. And then the best solution to the endogeneity problem is if during the data collection process, you have already thought about the key possible alternative explanations and then you actually collected the variable that would cause endogeneity uh, if you didn't control for it. And then you have already collected the data and then you collected the variable that will cause the uh, uh, omitted variable barriers and then you control for that variable. Wouldn't that be the best solution? And um, I, I feel that it is more of a, a design problem than a um, kind of a post data collection problem. Of course, at the same time, I also understand that if you get secondary data from company, your, 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 your data is company sponsored. Oftentimes you don't have the power to dictate, uh, like I wanna collect this variable, I wanna collect that variable. Your data is whatever that's, you know, the best data you can get from the company. I understand that too. So if that's the case, also try to be a little more transparent and try to be a little more proactive when writing the first submission, at least don't, uh, you know, dash on the problem and to just say, okay, yeah, there is an indoctrinated problem and we think there, these are the possible causes. And oftentimes uh, before you magically find a perfect instrument, you can possibly just get some side evidence on how large the endogeneity problem is and uh, at which level the endogeneity problem come from. Uh, I think in Mikko's review uh, of his very structured review of the, edit, uh, of the letters he wrote, he mentioned oftentimes you have panel data or multi-level data, say you have um, uh, observation within companies, uh, that kind of structure and you have uh, a lot of companies and then you have multi-period observation within companies, then, I mean, a very important question regarding endogeneity is whether you think this endogeneity arise from uh, cross companies or arise from uh, even within companies over time. So uh, that's very important because if it mostly coming from uh, across companies and then uh, you perhaps have a pretty good solution if you apply the right panel model, uh, panel data models. If it comes from a source that uh, not only across companies, but also within companies over time, then it will be a lot harder. So having that uh, transparency and discussion upfront, I think it helps with yourself and the reviewers because then you set a boundary for the reviewers. Reviewers cannot come back and have a blanket statement saying, hey man, you have an endogeneity problem, you're done. Well, we know that we have an endogeneity problem and then we have already discussed the possible uh, sources of endogeneity. And then at this point, I think the ball rolls back to the reviewers and if they wanna propose even more alternative solutions, alternative causes for endogeneity, because you did a great job of uh, proposing alternative explanations. And then if they wanna come up with something else, they got to go at least uh, with your standard of uh, rigor in terms of uh, talking about those um, sources of endogeneity. So that's what I would add. Yeah, I, I want to add uh, two things. One is that uh, research does not and it cannot be perfect and flawless, but you need to try your best. And uh, the department tries to point you out to the most recent understanding of methods and tries to help you to, uh, to improve your studies. Of course, sometimes you may be pushed to do something that you don't really understand. And in, in that case, it might be a good idea to say that you are also applying a simpler technique because you understand it. And uh, simpler techniques are less likely to be misapplied than complex techniques. For example, we did not really encounter any uh, 
gross misapplication of regression analysis in the review, but we encountered uh, misapplications of two stage least squares and let alone three stage least squares. So simpler techniques should be preferred unless there is a really good reason to use a com more complex technique. And related to uh, the comment about endogeneity, in uh, the methods review template that I sent to reviewers, and I specifically asked them that if they complain about the endogeneity, they need to explain what is the, uh, the source. So uh, if they think that there's an omitted variable E, then you should really, really name what is the E. So, so what, what is the omitted variable? So if, if uh, you say that there could be an omitted variable and you don't name the variable, then how are the authors going to address that question? If you think that there is two-way causality, then point out to a theory or empirical finding that say that Y is actually a cause of X and not the other way around. So it is, it's not only, like you said, about uh, authors providing evidence and justification, but also reviewers providing evidence. Otherwise, endogeneity will just become something that you can uh, stamp on any paper to reject it. Very good. I think if I'm hearing a couple of big themes here, one of them is transparency. And I think on average, we could save an entire round of review for papers if they would come with that transparency initially. Often the first round is simply Miko or reviewers asking questions about what authors actually did. And they can't evaluate, they can't comment until they know what authors actually did. And so it takes a whole round just to figure out what was done. And then really the second round is what should have been the first round. And so we could save a lot of time for authors, for reviewers, for editors, for all of us, if transparency got more emphasis right up front. And I think another big theme here is we wanna publish papers and we know papers can't be perfect. And there are often trade-offs with rigor and level of interest. And we're not really wanting to publish perfectly rigorous papers that are uninteresting and that make little contribution. So we don't want people to come away from this session with the impression that your methods have to be 100% perfect, rigorous all the time but we do want to avoid the common pitfalls and problems that have tripped up many authors. And the session's for reviewers just as much as it's for authors, because all of us as a community, like Suzanne said at the beginning, uh, we're, we're looking to grow and develop and help each other publish good research. It's no good for our community if we use uh, methods, problems to keep papers out and keep good research from coming to light. So it's incumbent on all of us as authors, as researchers, to do rigorous, high-quality research, to think about these things before, while we're designing our research and while we're collecting our data. And then it's incumbent on us as reviewers to look for possibilities and ways to explain things, to help authors, to be developmental, not to just make simple statements that try to cause quick rejection decisions. I want to thank Miko and others for organizing this session as well, primarily. And uh, I hope you found it helpful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice conference. We look forward to seeing many of you back in half an hour for JOM's award session. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for being here. See you soon. Thanks, everyone.